So one of the key ways we'll study representations is by decomposing them into smaller representations. So uh, let me define what I mean by that. So a decomposition of a representation R from G to GLNC is a splitting of Cn, in other words, the vector space on which these matrices act, uh, as a direct sum V1, direct sum up to Vk, where each Vi is a sub-representation of Cn. So what does that mean? That means um, that R, G, V is in V, I whenever um, v, v is in V, I. So in other words, if we start off in one of these pieces and apply our matrix, then we stay inside that piece. That's what it means to be a sub-representation. Okay, so in this case, we can write R, G as a block diagonal matrix. It's RG restricted to V1 all the way down to RG restricted to VK. And all the off diagonal blocks are zero. So another way of writing this is to say that R is the direct sum of R restricted to V1, direct sum up to R restricted to Vn. So in such a decomposition, we'd like the pieces to be as small as possible, the VKs, v, V1 up to VK, the subspaces to be as small as possible, because then, you know, our matrix entries will be concentrated near the diagonal. There won't be many off diagonal entries and everything will be simpler. So what do we mean by as small as possible? Definition, a subrepresentation V and CN is what's called irreducible if it has no proper subrepresentations. Okay, so remember, subrepresentations are subspace that's preserved by the action of the group. So this is saying there's no subrepresentations other than the zero vector, just as a subspace itself, that's always preserved by everything, and the whole space itself, V. Okay, so we'd like to decompose our representations as direct sums of irreducible subrepresentations, and that's not always possible. We'll see an exercise where you can find something that doesn't decompose in that way. However, we're gonna focus on those for which it is possible. Um, so lemma, um, if Cn, the vector space of our representation, admits an invariant Hermitian inner product which I'll define as the proof goes on, uh, then the representation can be decomposed into irreducible summands. So in this case, we say that the representation is completely reducible. Now we'll see that for some groups like U1, the unit complex numbers, any representation admits an invariant emission in a product, whatever that means. Um, so we can always decompose into irreducible summands for those groups. And that'll actually work for any compact group. So any group whose uh, matrix entries are bounded. Um, but there are certainly examples where 
you don't get complete reducibility, even for very simple groups, non-compact groups. So here's the idea of the proof. So I can give you the idea without telling you what a Hermitian inner product is. It's something like a dot product. So um, the idea will be you break up your representation as much as you think you can, and then you look at one of your summands. And suppose it's not irreducible. So if V inside CN, or let's say VI, is not irreducible, we want to be able to break it up further. Well, if it's not irreducible, then it contains a sub-representation. Let's say U. Um, so we're halfway there, we've got U, we want another thing to add to you to get vi and what we'll be able to do is take the orthogonal complement of u with respect to the inner product so take u orthogonal complement i'll tell you what that means later this will be a sub-representation two and vi will be u direct sum U orthogonal complement. So you can always split it up further if it's not irreducible. And eventually this process has to terminate because, you know, if you go all the way down to one dimensional subspaces, then they are automatically irreducible because they don't have any proper subspaces at all. Just, you know, never mind representations, they don't have any proper subspaces. So this terminates at some point. Um, you know, because one dimensional representations are irreducible. I'm not saying that you always decompose into one dimensional representations. I'm just saying that that's the kind of safety blanket. You go down as far as you can until you get irreducible things. It could be that you go all the way down to one dimensional things and then they're automatically irreducible. So to prove the lemma, I need to tell you what a Hermitian inner product is what it means for it to be invariant and why the orthogonal complement of a subrepresentation is a subrepresentation. So, definition. A Hermitian inner product is a map, which I'll write as angle brackets from Cn times Cn to C. So it eats two complex vectors and spits out a complex number such that various axioms hold, um, or various properties are satisfied, let's say. Um, so we should think of this as a bit like dot product, but what goes wrong with dot product for complex vectors is the following. If you just take the dot product of V with itself, you get the sum of squares of components of V, and that's a complex number but we would like the length of V to be the square root of this complex number and length should really be a real number. So a much better thing to do would be to take V angle bracket V to be the sum of VK bar VK because that's automatically real and it's actually positive unless V is zero. So it's this second guy that we're trying to abstract the properties of. So um, we want V inner product V to be real and positive unless V equals zero, in which case it should be zero. What else? Well, looking at this formula, um, imagine I put in two different vectors, U and V, and I did UK bar VK and sum that. This is no longer symmetric in U and V. It's got a bar over the U and not over the V. So when you switch the two entries, V and U, and take the inner product, what you get is not U inner product V, but it's, it's conjugate. This expression is complex linear in V. So if I do U inner product AV1 plus BV2, that should expand as a u v1 plus b u in a product v2. 
But now, in the first entry, if I try doing the same thing, AU1 plus BU2, and inner producting that with V, um, I no longer have the freedom to say what this is because it's actually specified by the symmetry and the um, linearity condition here. And actually, if you figure out what it is, it's A bar U1 bracket V plus B bar U2 bracket V. So this is not linear in this entry. When you pull the scalar outside the brackets, it picks up a conjugate sign. So it's a bit of a funny, uh, funny formula, but it's entirely intended to abstract the properties of this example, which is u inner product v equals sum from k equals one to n of u bar k v k. Okay, so this is the standard Hermitian inner product on Cn. So what does it mean for this to be invariant? It means that if I apply a matrix from my representation to u and to v, that shouldn't change the inner product. So RGU, inner product RGV should be u inner product v. So if I have such an inner product with this nice symmetry, this invariance, then the claim is the orthogonal complement of a subrepresentation is a subrepresentation. That's what I want to prove. So claim given an invariant Hermitian inner product and a subrepresentation u u orthogonal complement, which is defined to be the set of vectors uh, w such that um, u inner product w equals zero for all u and u. Um, this is a subrepresentation. That's what we need to prove. Because then we can split our representation as u plus its orthogonal complement whenever we can find a subrepresentation u. So let's prove the claim. Um, what do I need to do to show something as a subrepresentation? I need to start with a W in U orthogonal complement. I need to apply RG to it. And I want to check that that is still in U orthogonal complement. So this is what we want. Well, to do that, I need to take the inner product of RGW with U where u is in big U, the subrepresentation. So what I can do is I can apply RG inverse inside the angle brackets to both of the arguments without changing the value of the inner product because it's invariant. And I get RG inverse u inner product, RG inverse RGW. The RG inverse RG cancel give me the identity because R is a representation. So this is just RG inverse U inner product W. But now U is a subrepresentation, so RG inverse of little u stays in big U. And W is in U orthogonal complement, so this inner product vanishes. So that shows me that if I start with something in the orthogonal complement and I apply a matrix from the representation, I stay in the orthogonal complement.